Good, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here for this um, important side event and uh, discussion. And uh, thanks to the co-organizers and sponsors for pulling together this really important um, dialogue around how we can collaborate better and work differently across um, the space to address both protection risks and, and food, uh, food insecurity. As the emergency relief uh, coordinator, uh, Martin Griffiths, uh, has commented uh, and stressed, hunger and food insecurity have continued to rise over the past year. Uh, while we also know that protection risks and displacement have been key drivers um, of humanitarian need over the past uh, decade. And I think the theme for our discussion today is so important precisely because we know that there is such a strong correlation between these record levels of acute food insecurity that we're seeing globally and the unprecedented levels of people uh, affected by conflict, uh, disaster, and displacement. Conflict and insecurity, according to the most recent global report on food uh, crisis, remain the biggest driver of food insecurity in 19 countries or territories where more than 117 million uh, people were living in what we call IPC3 uh, plus, so crisis levels uh, or above. Um, we're now, I should say, also seeing uh, economic shocks linked to conflict and global food system shocks becoming a significant driver of, of food insecurity. Uh, indeed, in some countries, even the main driver of uh, food uh, insecurity uh, now in places like uh, South Sudan and, and Syria adding an additional layer of complexity to contexts that are already uh, complex. Colleagues, we all know from our uh, experience that food security is closely tied to a person and a household's ability to generate uh, income. In many cases, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, this income often comes from uh, agricultural livelihoods. And when these agricultural livelihoods are compromised, are damaged, uh, are disrupted by conflict or disaster or displacement, the impact on household food security can be immense, with then um, a serious uh, flow-on, uh, knock-on effect uh, in terms of increased protection risks, right? So this relationship between these two issues, I think, is fundamental uh, for uh, our shared understanding. What does it mean then for uh, individuals and communities who find themselves in this situation? When people lose their livelihoods um, and are not able to access sufficient and nutritious food, they are often tragically forced to resort to negative coping strategies. And we have this, it's a very sort of, uh, it sounds like a very cold phrase, right? It's a rather scientific phrase, but I think we all understand what's behind that in terms of uh, the realities um, that families are faced with and the choices that they need to make to feed their uh, families. These choices can often then uh, increase uh, risks to safety and, and dignity. We see evidence, but here again I would say we have a collective responsibility to further deepen that evidence base mm -hmm. that uh, when household food security is compromised, protection risks increase significantly. Uh, and, as we well know, women and girls suffering the most. This can mean that girls are no longer able to att uh, attend school or must help a family cope with climate change induced shocks such as drought. It can mean that women are more likely to resort to activities um, uh, to meet the basic needs of households under stress such as making dangerous journeys, whether to collect firewood or to access water um, because they cannot afford to buy fuel or indeed resorting to um, uh, dangerous income generating activities, exposing them to the risk of gender-based violence and other forms of, of harm. Uh, these are realities I think we're, we're familiar with, uh, but we need to be driven forward by this shared uh, understanding. All of us, including FAO, that work in complex crisis contexts, it's of course uh, indispensable uh, that um, the protection therefore is central to uh, our collective response activities and that we as food security actors understand and address the protection risks uh, that specifically flow from acute food insecurity and can compromise the safety and dignity of affected uh, populations. There are two key areas uh, which FAO sees as critical to embedding centrality of protection in uh, our responses in these complex food crisis contexts. The first relates specifically to how, as food security actors, we work in these settings. When working with highly vulnerable populations who are suffering acute food insecurity, we must, uh, as a starting point, fully understand vulnerabilities to protection risks. 
and to ensure that we are working with these populations, uh, that as we're working with these populations, we're adopting uh, an approach which uh, at a minimum does no uh, harm, but which uh, protects and respects safety uh, and dignity. This is incumbent on all actors, not just specialized protection agencies, not just FAO, although we indeed do take this responsibility uh, seriously indeed. It means in practical terms that as food security actors, we need to coordinate and work even more closely with traditional protection actors, leveraging their expertise in analysis and understanding uh, to deepen our shared understanding of protection risks. This can be through improved uh, coordination um, between cluster mechanisms. Great to see colleagues from also the Global Food Security Cluster here in this important uh, discussion uh, today, um, which is being chaired obviously by the Global uh, Protection Cluster. I think these types of stronger partnerships between UN entities and obviously uh, uh, between uh, NGO protection actors as well to improve uh, protection outcomes and interventions is key. The second uh, area, just to flag quickly, uh, relates to how FAO specifically works to address increased protection risks that occur as a result of food uh, insecurity. In so many of the contexts we're facing, uh, where populations traditionally rely on agriculture, there are huge opportunities for us in a positive sense to reduce protection risks through comprehensive uh, agricultural livelihood assistance, both early on in a crisis and in a protracted food crisis uh, context. I would say I'm probably already taking more time than Sam wants me, but just uh, parenthetically, uh, um, I see this country by country in terms of missions that we go on and, and crises that we visit. Recently in Somalia, meeting with um, uh, a number of displaced families uh, located outside of or around uh, Baidoa. All of these families uh, relied on agriculture for their livelihoods before. All of them told the same story about being forced to move because their crops had died in the fields and because their livestock uh, were died. And all of them talked about the experience of these 100, 120, 200 kilometer journeys and what that had meant in very uh, visceral terms uh, for uh, their families and, and themselves. So this, this connection between meaningful support to agricultural interventions as a preventative uh, protection strategy, I think, is, is really, uh, really important. We can, using these tools and others, uh, significantly reduce the protection risk that households are facing. I could talk about all of this for a long time, but let me stop here uh, because I'm very, very keen to hear, as I know the panelists are, on the experience uh, that will be shared by uh, you in the room and by colleagues online. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for hosting the event.